Um, so thank you so much for making out your time in the early hours of a Saturday. I know as a college student, Saturday and Sunday is very precious. So you guys have been here for making a difference. So let me first quickly give an uh, introduction about myself. I'm advocate Priya Dashni. I practice in the Honorable Supreme Court of India. And uh, so my connect with NCC is one thing which I wanted to display to you. Uh, for you people to understand that the uniforms you're wearing are just not uniforms. It's responsibility. It's responsibility for the rest of your life. All that learning which you are being taught is not taught by any Tom, Dick and Harry. It is taught by experts. It's taught by the Army, Navy and Air Force officers themselves which is not available or which is not common in any other organizations in India or most across abroad. So my intent of taking you people on board here is first to understand the responsibility you all hold as an NCC cadet. Once an NCC cadet, always an NCC cadet, and I am one and I'm so proud of it. So I was uh, the Youth Ambassador of India to United Kingdom. Uh, I was 2005 batch, way before quite old now. So, uh, so the government of India sent me to United uh, Kingdom as Youth Ambassador of India. And I was the contingent placard holder for Tamil Nadu, Andaman and Nicobar uh, Island, the uh, contingent. And um, so in my earlier days, I was with Bharat Scouts and Guides. I was with Duke of Edinburgh. So the reason why I'm again reciting all these things to you is there is a lot, a bigger role for a woman in this community in this country as whole. And I'm so, so glad to see so many young women cadets coming over to hear what is it you can do in your future. This journey of yours will surely not stop after you remove this uniform, trust me. You are not normal cadets, you are not normal students. The choice of taking the pain of this to learn whatever parade, to learn what is national spirit, to understand the importance of our own country is not an easy task. Enterprising member of parliament, uh, Dr. Hina Gavit, she has been the youngest uh, chairperson to be heading a parliamentary committee. So Hina Gavit, ma'am, is with us. And uh, we have Dr. Amita Mullavatil. So she is uh, the founder for DLF uh, Foundation. I'm sorry, I've been running. And uh, she's with us for the discussion. And we also have Dr. Ashok Pandey, who is an educationalist. And uh, he is the director for a group of uh, schools, Alcon International and Alcon Public. And the topic that we're going to discuss today is the role of women leaders in nation building. The role of women leaders in nation building. So we're going to have a very, very interesting conversation with uh, all three panelists of ours. And uh, so if somebody, if our time permits, we will quickly take two, three questions from the audience. One, make your question very crisp. Two, remember your cadets. You can't misbehave. And uh, three, uh, one cadet can have only one question because we have our event after this session, so we have to wrap it up at the earliest. So just ensure that you grasp the best out of what these speakers are going to share with you. I'm sure it's going to be a lovely experience to you all. My only request is please take this learning back home. Jojo's cheese yahan pe sikriyo yahan chodne ke liye nahi hai. Zindagi bar haat mein rakke aage badna hai. Is that clear? Wonderful. When the chief guests are coming, please raise up and clap your hands. Okay, I'm just getting them. A very good morning to all our young cadets present here, here on dais with us. We've got eminent personalities of great um, stature who's been with us to share their uh, journey to leadership as a woman, and uh, we also have Sir here, Ashok Pandey Sir, 
who is going to give a male perspective of a women leadership. So quickly let me introduce the panel to you all. Uh, Dr. Hina Garrett, Honorable Member of Parliament. Uh, Madam is the Chairperson for the Committee on Women Empowerment. So Hina Garrett, ma'am, has been one of the outstanding performer uh, in the Parliament. And she has been one of the youngest MPs to be in the Parliament. So this is her second term as a Member of Parliament. And uh, she has, I'd, she's a doctor by profession. She chose to be in politics. So she is one of the best examples that politics is beyond uh, age. Politics is beyond having that image of a tainted uh, vision of what we have. So one round of applause to Hina, ma'am, who's been with us today. Thank you. So here we have Dr. Amita Mulla Vatil, ma'am. Well, uh, I can t take the entire day to talk about her. But uh, so ma'am right now is the chairperson education for DLU Foundation. So ma'am has about 50 years of experience in education. So uh, I presume she should be one of the youngest uh, uh, women who had started the teaching profession and uh, a wonderful person by heart, rich with, you know, enriched and rich experience. Um, so she is one person who most of the women uh, around her look up to her as a, um, um, a solace or look, look up to her for uh, any help, advice. So she is one person who loves women taking up leadership role. And uh, thank you so much for being with us today, ma'am. And I have Ashok Pandey, sir, with me. So he is another gem of a person. Uh, for, for the personality, he is undoubtedly. But otherwise, the amount of opportunity he gives to women in his organization is unbelievable. So sir is a director of a group of schools, Alcon International and Alcon Public School. And he is an educationalist for uh, about 30, 40 years. So sir has uh, been giving uh, opportunities for his uh, women employ women. Uh, um, colleagues, and he has also been encouraging them to take up leadership role. Uh, well, not just his own organization, to me as well. So my relation with Sir has been about uh, four or five years now. He's, he's also on board with us as a mentor for our organization. So uh, we, were very Im we felt it is very important to take the male perspective when we talk about women leadership. So thank you so much for being with us, Sir. Thank you. Uh, so without further delay, I'm quickly going to ask you, ma'am. Um, uh, so I'm starting with uh, Hina Gavit, ma'am. Thank you for chairing over this session for us. Uh, one of uh, the youngest parliamentarian, and we are so proud for the way you actually stand. So today's topic which we're going to talk is uh, the role of women leaders in nation building. So we have one from politics. We have one from administration and we have one from education. So I think like this is the best of the combination we can ever ask for. So please tell us what do you mean and why is it important for women leadership? Uh, first of all, thank you so much Priyaji for wonderful words. Uh, and thank you for having me here on this uh, wonderful uh, platform. Uh, as a women parliamentarian, uh, one thing that I feel that uh, for any country to develop, it is both men and women whose contribution is very, very important for any nation to go ahead. If you see not just today, but pre-independence times also, we had so many women leaders who have contributed so much into our independence uh, struggle and uh, in different fields. So I think uh, it is very, very important to have uh, uh, women uh, more actively participating into uh, the growth and development of a country. And uh, when I say this, I, I just don't speak about the professionals, uh, those women who are into different professions, but it starts from a homemaker to a mother to a woman who is, in, uh, who is a working woman 
to those women who are into government, those women who are working in the private sector. So it's a collectively, I uh, believe that uh, the contribution of women is very, very important. And uh, I feel very fortunate to be a part of um, uh, the Women Empowerment Committee, which is working towards the empowerment of uh, women in the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Check. Yeah. Um, um, Amita, ma'am, we would want to know, because you have had a big leg in uh, education. You had now taken up administrative role. And now women empowerment is not what we talk about 50, 60 years before where there has to be equality. I think now we've, to an extent, addressed that. Now women empowerment is more about being independent, taking their own choices, and the right or uh, the, the urge to work. How do you manage your family? How do you manage your, uh, your profession, your ambition? Because I'm sure these young girls, once they pass out of college, they have their own uh, careers. But once the, the family starts, so there is much of balance which has to be made. Please. Namaskar and uh, good morning to all of these wonderful young women sitting here. Let's give you a big clap. <laughs> Though, Priya Darshini, I would have been much happier if there were some boys from the NCC here. Don't you agree? <laughs> Leate. <laughs> I'm going to tell General GP, you only send the young girls. At least here we have Ashok. So, I want to thank Mr. Srinivasan for this wonderful opportunity. <coughs> and you, uh, Priyadarshini, for the person you are. And I'm so happy to meet with, with Hina ji. And to know the kind of passion that she has. And when we spoke just now at tea, it was fabulous. And I know you're going to go a long way. Perhaps you'll become the prime minister of the country. Who knows? <laughs> right? Um, thank you, Ashok. Uh, somebody who's very close to my heart and who's been on a journey with me for so many, many years as a friend, as a guide in so many ways. Um, I just want to tell you that I have been a child of war. Uh, when I was 14 years old, my father died in the 1971 Bangladesh War. He's a war hero. He got the Mahavir Chakra. If you Google my name, my father's name will come up. And it was very tough for us. Because you know, at that age, suddenly you're in a family of only women. There was me, my mother, who was only 34 years old, my sister, and my grandmother, who was also a very young widow. So there were just four of us. And we had to then take this forward. But my mother was the true heroine because she said, Papa may have gone, but I'm there and we're all there to look after each other. And that's when she told me and we understood the power of education. And this is something that we as women should never forget. When they talk about beti parhao, that's extremely important. Because all of you who are sitting here today are what you are because of the schools that you have attended, the education that you've got, and the fact that the family has supported you in ensuring that you are educated. So when I was 14 years old, I was in a boarding school when my father died, and he never came back because his ship sank. It was torpedoed by a Pakistani submarine. It sank. His body never came back, and we were alone. But we were not alone, because we were women together. And that is the time when I realized that I must become a teacher. Why did I realize that then? Because I thought that if wars begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men we have to find peace. We have to build peace. And peace can only be built and experienced in schools. Because whoever we are, between the ages of 6 and 16, all the learning happens. After that, it's experience. And so my journey as a teacher started when my first job 
was at the age of 16. Because I had to do earn and learn. Because we didn't have so much money. And in those days, the Mahavir Chakra was only 10,000 rupees. And it took one year to get pension. We had a very tough life. Suddenly from everything, we had nothing. But we had the belief that we are strong women. There may be some of you sitting here who may have gone through some tragedies. Life is not the same for everyone. But remember that you have the power of learning. You can change the world. And so, through education, as my first job at the age of 16, I evolved. At that point of time, I was just a school pass. And I was sent to do a UNESCO project in Gorakhpur. And in those days, Gorakhpur was the badlands. And there was a government school there. And when I went there, the headmaster said to me, Pata nahi kaha se aa Inko kuch aate hi nahi hai. Aise hi bhej dete hai. So I said, Sir, kya karu? He said, Soti lo. Tum beater teacher bano. Aur jisko, jisne padha hai, degree kari hai, wo teacher teacher hogi. So I became the beater teacher. My job was, so bachche bethe hai the class mein, to jo bachcha chillata tha, usko beat karna tha. Horrible. But after one week, I told the headmaster, I cannot be the beta teacher. I know I am not a teacher teacher, but I will not be the beta teacher. Or many nokri chordi. My first job was 70 rupees. That was my salary. And then I came back, but I shut down that school. I was just 16 years old. I came to Delhi. I spoke at the UNESCO office. I said, You can't have children who are being beaten like that. I don't want to go forward. I'll wait for Priyadarshini to ask some other questions. But the message I'm leaving behind you is be strong, irrespective of whether there's a man in your life or not. You have the strength. You have the education. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Inspirational as ever. Wonderful to hearing you. I've heard this uh, story at least 100 times, but every time I hear this, it's as fresh as I'm hearing it for the first time. Thank you, ma'am. And we have Ashok, sir, here. Ashok, sir, actually, uh, with, with all my heart, I need to tell you that there is something very unique in you, uh, which uh, I just don't see you preaching women empowerment, but I see you acting on women empowerment. So I want to hear from you, sir, why do you think women empowerment is important, and women in leadership, for that matter of fact? Hello. Yeah, thank you, uh, Priyadarshini. Uh, before I come straight to answering your question, two or three things are flashing in my mind. Uh, you just heard the inspiring story of uh, Dr. Amita Mullavatal, a great friend and well-wisher, Dr. Hina, and Priyadarshini. Let us not uh, forget her. And all these three ladies sitting here are the role models for all of us because their stories are inspiring, their work is inspiring, and the contribution they are making and they have made uh, to the community is absolutely fantastic. Since I have known them all, Madam, of course, is member of parliament. I do not have the privilege of interacting with her, but at least through Sansad Ratna Award, ma'am, I have known a lot about you, read a lot about you, and I know uh, where you actually come from. So, I am very, very privileged that I am in the company of these three, and if I can use the word awesome ladies. So please clap for them first. And this is, I think, a privilege for you as well. The second thing which is flashing in my mind is that I was also NCC officer at one stage, and I was the Navy NCC officer, so I was donning the white dress. I miss it. I'm feeling very nostalgic and uh, dealing with young boys and girls like them. So that is the second thing. Uh, which is making me very, very uh, touchy and emotional. And the third thing from the country's perspective, you know, we are sitting here on a very, very holy day, you know, in the sense that we are through the week of Navratras. Uh, the holy month of Ramadan has started only yesterday. And I think this occasion could not have been more auspicious than what it is today. And therefore, I thank uh, 
the prime time Srinivasan ji, Pradarshini ji, uh, for organizing this in such a magnificent hall. Uh, this itself is very, very inspiring for all of you and I'm sure you're going back with a lot of good memories. So with this little bit of preface, let me come to this. Uh, Pradarshini's uh, question has got two uh, parts to it. First of all, why it is important? It's very simple, you know. I mean, you cannot think of anything good to happen, not only in this country, but in the whole world, if half of the population is not a participant to it. Can you imagine anything good to happen? It is just impossible. Now, the second thing is, unfortunately, uh, it has not happened. And in, in fact, that is what we need to discuss, uh, why it has not happened. And since all of you are young boys and girls and you have no time to read a lot and, and you want only a very quick information, so let me give you a couple of quick informations, you know. So in India, uh, the workforce uh, of men and women uh, should be what? How per how, what percentage of women should be in the workforce? Anyone, quickly? 50%. Uh, so 50%? Actually, it is 19%. In the GDP of the country, which is more than $600 billion, uh, the contribution of women today is only 19%, because they are not part of the productivity and manufacturing and services and all that. And one estimate says that if equal opportunity is given to the women, they will add more than $700 billion every year to our economy. Now, what more proof you require uh, to, to suggest that why it is important for the women to be part of the nation building? So when we talk of the nation building, I think it is equal opportunity, and not only equal opportunity, equal treatment, and patronage, and sponsorship, and mentoring, you know, so that at every successive stage, uh, you have the opportunity to take equal part in India's growth. And India's growth, let me tell you young boys and girls here, is the world's growth. You know, every sixth person on this earth is an Indian. So imagine whatever happens in India changes the whole statistics of the world. And that statistics of the world will be doubled if we ensure that our if women also have the same power and same opportunity. Now, as a young boy, uh, when I grew up, when I was in my post-graduation, there were 35 seats in MSc Physics, and there were only two girls. You see, back in 80s that I'm talking about. So I have seen it. When I took up my teaching career, uh, the percentage of women was very less. Things are much better today. And therefore, somehow, uh, coming from the background that I am, I'm not going to details of it, and the, the workforces and my working and my experience with working, I somehow realized that uh, if I cannot do anything in this world, at least as a man, I must ensure that wherever I'm in a leadership position, can I create opportunities for everybody and not only for men. So that was something which came almost inborn. And that is why we created a lot of opportunities where women have that kind of opportunity. The second aspect, uh, Pradarshini, which is very important is that it is not only I am saying, the research has proved it. The tons and reams of research suggests that an organization which has diversity, which has equity, and which has inclusion, very popularly it is now known as DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion that organization's capacity to innovate and create increases by 20%. And of course, that organization's capacity uh, to work better and produce better also increases by 30%. So these are the researches, but our country, uh, I'm sure as we are talking today, and it is very important for the uh, young uh, cadets here to know, that as on today we are talking, the first lady officer, Shiva Chauhan, is in Siachen. Do you know this? The women are in combat. They are the fighter pilots. They are in STEM. They are doctors, engineers, social workers, members of parliament, top educationists in the country, top social workers, anywhere. 
So now that stereotype that the gender specific jobs which we perpetuated uh, unjustifiably for 75 years is changing now and I'm very, very happy about it. And the government is also working very hard to ensure uh, that the girls are not denied any opportunity. But I think we have a long way to go uh, and we have to do much more than what we are ostensibly doing today. Uh, but I think you being here and you are getting this experience, you, you, you have the opportunity, some of them already, I think you should also think of it that uh, how you can be a role model, how you can be more accountable to bring gender parity, how can you go deep into the root causes, why it is happening, and how you can contribute to course correction so that we also become a country in the real sense where men and women go marching together for the greater prosperity of this country. Thank you very much. So now I really feel we should have had male cadets there. <laughs> it's very important we should have had boy cadets there. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much for that uh, clear, in-depth understanding uh, and uh, delivering it so beautifully. Uh, Hina, ma'am, see, um, whatever profession we talk of equality, well, I talk about gender equality, I think politics, we are yet not in that gender equality at all. And uh, secondly, we still are not as open to youngsters taking up roles in politics. So you have a double challenge here. You are a woman and you are one of the youngest women and most importantly, you are a performing woman. So there should be multiple challenges that you would have faced. And please tell us how you handle your situation. So, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, speak about my life before becoming a member of parliament. I um, was doing my medical education. I'm a doctor by profession while doing my post-graduation. Uh, so, I come from uh, a tribal and rural area of Maharashtra, uh, which is one of the most difficult and interior areas. So, uh, I did my schooling there and uh, got into medical uh, through the CET, got admission in Mumbai, and suddenly from a rural area, I went to a metro city, that to Mumbai. Most of the people didn't know where uh, was the place from where I come. My, uh, my hometown is Nandurbar, which is a distinct place, but people in Mumbai used to ask me, where is Nandurbar? So I, used, I come from that area. And uh, while doing my medical studies, I knew that the area I represent had lots of uh, health issues. And be being a doctor, I thought, uh, why not I should do something for the tribal area which I uh, come from. And I started doing health camps. So uh, I used to invite all my professors and teachers who used to teach us in the medical college to my district. I had my own NGO. And through that NGO, we used to do health camps. While doing health camps, I kind of developed a connect with the local tribal people. Initially, they used to speak about their health issues to me. And then later on, they started speaking about the regional issues, like they did not have drinking water in their village. They did not have electricity. They did not have roads. They had to walk for 10, 10 kilometers to reach to their house. And that was every day not like only one day. If they have to go to uh, go for work, they have to walk 10 to 15 kilometers and then reach the place of their work and then come again. So uh, I thought that, see, I am becoming a doctor. Well, only one thing that I can do is I can uh, treat the diseases in this area. But if I feel that the condition of these people should improve, then I have to take a step forward and along with the health sector, I should start working in the social sector also. And that was when I felt that uh, uh, becoming a member of parliament can really help me solve their issues because that will give me a platform where I can speak about their water problem, their electricity problem, their housing problem, their health problem, and get those issues sorted. I was just 26 at that point of time, 26 year old. And uh, then the member of parliament who was representing Nandurbar was a nine time MP whose age was 80 plus. And uh, I used to think if like other youngsters, even I say, Achha, hamare to leaders kuch kari nahi rahe, 
हमारे एम ने कुछ करना चाहिए हमारे एम ने कुछ करना चाहिए so who is going to make the difference somebody has to take a step forward and do it it is very easy to point fingers at others and say isne ye nahi kiya isne ye nahi kiya agar mujhe lagta hai mere area mein ye hona chahiye to why should i expect it from others why shouldn't i go myself in that place and try and do something for our people that was the thought in my mind when i thought of contesting election but accepting a young girl who has not even completed her studies into politics that thought only in the first place was not accepted by many people some people when i um, i was contesting in my election campaign people used to also say are ye to sirf 26 saal ki hai jo jinke samne ye lad rahi wo to 40 saal se mp un iski to utni umar bhi nahi hai मतलब दैट वॉज द थॉट दे हैड इन दे माइंड सो लेट मी टेल यू इट वॉज इन वेरी इजी इट इज़ वेरी चैलेंजिंग फॉर अ यंग पर्सन नंबर वन टू कम इन टू दिस फील्ड सेकेंड यू आर अ वीमेन सो पीपल डोंट अनफॉर्चुनेटली अंटिल नाउ दैट एक्सेप्टेबिलिटी इज नॉट सो मच सो इट वॉज डेफिनेटली अ वेरी चैलेंजिंग थिंग फॉर मी and uh, i feel one good part today in our indian democracy is that in the uh, local panchayati raj three tier system there is a 50% reservation for women earlier there used to be uh, you know uh, a, if there is a reserve seat for women for sarpanch so any lady or the leader in that uh, village his wife or daughter or daughter in law would become the sarpanch and uh, it used to be the male member of the family who used to run the post but i think with education improving in the rural areas today we are having educated girls who are becoming sarpanch of the village they are themselves take, taking the decision of what they want to do because uh, you know when and in 2014 when first time i become i had become member of parliament we had so many sarpanchs who were women but they never used to come for the meetings it used to be their husbands or their father or uh, their father in law who used to come for the meetings and i used to read the name and i used to say the name is of lady and who is this male sitting so they said uh, no no we are the pratinidhi so we used to uh, you know in a lighter uh, note we used to say oh you are the xerox you are the xerox copy you not the original so uh, that was uh, the trend i would say a few years before but now with girls getting educated today girls are making decision and uh, i'm happy to share this that today i have uh, some members of parliament my colleagues in the parliament women uh, members who have come from the three tier system who were zilla parishad member after that became zilla parishad president and today they are members of parliament so i think slowly that trend is changing and education is in a true sense empowering women so uh, but when we talk of politics of course in the um, assembly or the parliament elections we don't uh, have reservation for women uh, but uh, some political parties like uh, i come from bjp so i can definitely speak about bjp within party they have certain number of tickets reserved for women candidates so they say even if there is no uh, political reservation for the seat but within the party they decide that okay we will have 33% of our candidates who will be women who will be contesting so i think uh, within political parties they have set a mandate now that they uh, they will have certain number of women candidates even if there is no reservation but it is definitely uh, improving i would say i will not say that today we have a complete changed picture but um, since the time 2014 until now we have the highest number of women members of parliament we have 81 members of parliament out of uh, 542 elected uh, lok sabha mps which is close to about uh, 15% and is not that great number but uh, earlier it was 68 in 2014 today we have 81 so i definitely think that uh, the numbers are improving and with education now girls are also coming ahead earlier um, i will also share this that not many women or girls have uh, the knowledge of the political field 
and therefore uh, because of less knowledge or because of not uh, really being aware of what they can do here uh, not many women think of joining politics second about politicians we have a very different image unfortunately the bollywood has really tainted the image of politicians they say all politicians are uh, some criminal or corrupt or not uh, doing anything good for the country this is what they show in the bollywood movies and people have that mindset that is aise hi hai but it's not like that people are very good you see people like us who really work day in and day out for the welfare of people so uh, today when you know people like us we become members of parliament i try and make sure that in my parliament constituency when i have 50% reserve seats for women i have most of the educated girls educated women sarpanch in my uh, constituency where they themselves are in the position of taking decision so i think uh, slowly the trend is changing and uh, now people have also started accepting with girls being educated girls uh, are becoming more empowered and when they are in the uh, decision making process sometimes they say nahi main jo bol rahi hu wahi sahi hai aur aise hi hona chahiye so now i think people are slowly accepting but i think it will still take little more time for us to uh, say that we are completely empowered and uh, we are we have become gender neutral it's not like that we really need to work on this and uh, i'm glad that things are moving uh, in the right direction now thank you thank you ma'am actually that's truly inspiring <laughs> no from where to where you have grown and uh, people may from outside see on a very short span of time she's become a member of parliament like time it's actually hard work for women and it's double hard work for uh, women who have aspirations so ma'am now with that we have uh, students here i'm like college students uh, i find a very uh, you know gap between just me and them the way they are you know and uh, i feel that i haven't had the social uh, social media pressure which these kids have these days uh, so i feel that uh, there is a lot of emotional turmoils which these kids go go through these days less on the sun more in front of the television and the mobile so the development is more virtual than in reality so what is the how do you want to train or what what is it you want to tell them to be like a leader what are the points which are required the qualities which are required to be a leader in reality not the virtual world so um firstly i'd like to thank you because uh, you've sort of reiterated uh, hina ji the importance of education and you've also reiterated multiple roles that you took on and coming back to priyadarshini's uh, question i think that is the essence of what young people have to understand today that their journey is going to be multiple their careers are going to be innumerable so if right now you have a certain concept in your mind that this is who i'm going to be it perhaps may not be because it's very clear that in your lifetime you may change 7 to 8 careers which means that there has to be a build up if you want to be a leader of resilience of being able to hang in there the fact that one has to understand 21st century skills which has been said again and again as to how do you collaborate how do you communicate and communication is something which has to be from person to person communication only telephonically or through a whatsapp university is not communication communication is the understanding of depth of learning it's being able to see multiple ways of how you look at life so i think it's very important that if you are a leader today we have to also think as hina ji says of getting into policy making you may be very young today but even if you are say even for myself as a teacher i told myself as a young person this is not the only thing i'm going to be because every time i moved first and foremost you must realize that you will move those days are gone when you hang on to one career in one place you will move you will move in multiple places and every time you move you will come all the way down because you will be in a new organization where they wouldn't know you you'll be dealing sometimes you'll feel i'm very good 
But then when you reach there, at a new place, you'll be all the way down, and you'll be dealing with people who are mediocre, who may be middle level. And then you'll again have to make your way up like that. So the point I'm saying is that today, in whatever context you are working, as I said to you, that for example, I told myself, I must try all different kinds of careers and break the stereotype, break the glass ceiling. And so what did I do? I said, let me get into journalism. It was all connected with the word, with education. And when I got into journalism, I became the editor of a, of a magazine called Parenting. And, and I had different challenges there. And then I said, let me get into hospitality. So I started writing in a travel magazine. And I would travel all across the world and comment on the, the cities or the places. That was a different challenge. And that's where I found a lot of men and women, by the way. The stereotype is not only men pulling you down, women also pull each other down, which I think is something that we must remember, that we must be strong together. Because very often, envy, jealousy, all these things, it's a crab mentality. So this is another stereotype we must break. It's not only about men, it's about women. We must support each other. We mustn't get upset if another woman is doing better. I think that's very essential, and I'm sure that young people will understand that because it's a highly competitive world today. And I think as a leader, the only person you should compete with is yourself. Because you have certain abilities which the other person doesn't have. How can you compete with somebody whose environment is different, whose background is different, who had different privileges, who may be having different material or not, how can you compete with them? So the best way to be a leader is compete with yourself. Develop and upgrade your own abilities, your own challenges. Keep upgrading yourself, whether it is through leading or learning or watching, essentially through practicing, through hands-on work. And I think another important thing is we have to go beyond ourselves. As Hinaji said, you have to think of the community. It's not only about ourselves. And politics is not the only way of thinking about the community. The NCC teaches you in a very big way to help the other, not to demonize the other, to be an integral part of the other. As Ashok ji said about diversity, inclusion, these are all important aspects of leadership. What's the point of saying it's only about me? Leadership is not only about me. In fact, you are the last to be thought of. It's about the other. Gandhi also said that. Bapu said that. It's about the other. It's about the other's face. It's about the poverty of the other. As an NCC group, you have these values that have been brought into you. And I think these values are which will take you across time. Because what you see, what you see around you is 1% career, material, profession, it's just 1%. You see a peak. The 99% is lying inside you. You have to develop that inner 99% to reach that 1%. But we only see that 1%. And we forget about that 99%, and that's why we get frustrated. Because we, we, we think, why haven't I got that? But have we worked on our inner model? The inner engineering of a human being is what makes leadership. And the inner engineering is there through upgradation, it's through thinking of the other person. There are four things that should become the mantra of your lives. And I want you to say it with me. Will you say it with me? Make that the mantra of your lives, okay? Can we start? So let's start with, if you want to make your life of substance, and you want to be a leader, there are these four things you have to think of. And they are, firstly, say it, diversity. diversity. Put your hand out. Diversity. diversity. Unity. Unity. Empowerment. Empowerment. And peace. peace. Say it again. Diversity. diversity. You must be diverse in your thinking, whether it's religious, whether it's political, whether it's learning, educational, whether it's sociological, whether it's economical, Diversity. Louder. Diversity. Unity. Empowerment. Peace. 
So what's the lesson? That the more diverse we are, in many ways, we'll become a united group of people because we'll understand that everybody has importance. Whoever they are, rich or poor, fair or dark, fat or thin, educated or uneducated, unfortunately. But we must respect diversity. Then we become a united group of people. And the moment you're in, in, united, what happens to you? Empowerment. And when you're empowered, you don't do violence on people. You become peaceful. Make this the mantra of your lives and you will become the leaders, which you already are, of the future. And the future is here. Thank you. Ashok sir, um, now that we have NCC cadets, all, all girl cadets, so I'm sure you see each one of them as a future leader. So please tell them, from your perspective, because you have been training NCC cadets yourself, from your perspective, like what is it they have to take back from NCC once they leave NCC? It's not that they leave NCC once they pass out with a C certificate. What is it they have to take back with them? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, <laughs> Pradarshini. I think what they have to take back from NCC, I think Dr. Amita has already made them chant and I'm sure they will remember it. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, as a leader, you know, if you want to be a leader, what is going to be very, very important for you is uh, that you have to work for people. You know, my definition of leader is slightly different. When I ask my people, what do you think is the leadership? And they will all say, you have to achieve results, you have to uh, scale the mountain, uh, you have to bring resources, and this and this and that. But then my next question is, uh, who will do all these things? Can you do it as a leader, whatever you want, alone? No. You have to work with a team. And a leader, therefore, my definition of leadership is, a leader is one who is dependent on his or her team. So it is your dependency on the people that should drive your leadership. And therefore, how to deal with people? how to take care of the people, you know, because in leadership, your position and your power will never make you a good leader. People may fear you, people may respect you, only because of the occupation that you have or the position you are occupying. But if you really want that kind of a respect, then you have to be people-centric. You have to invest yourself in people's development. And therefore, people will think that, no, you are invested in me, and therefore the same respect, which was because of fear of your position, will convert into uh, respect in the genuine sense. And then, your team and you together have to work for the development of your organization. So whatever organization you are working for, you have to take that organization to the next level. And when you and your people take the organization together, then all of you collectively start making contribution to the community. Because every organization is working for the community. Whether you are in production, you are in manufacturing, you are in service, whatever you are doing, you are serving the nation, everything is for the community. Everything is for the people. And then you reach the highest level or what we call the pinnacle. So therefore, the first thing, uh, that you have to learn, and this is what you do in NCC. You, you learn those nuances of leadership through regimentation, through discipline, through diversity, which Dr. Amita was saying. You know, because in NCC you will find people from all walks of life. You go for uh, your NCC camps. You don't meet only people from your locality. So that diversity uh, comes in that. And then, you know, the self-discipline is very, very important. For success in life, uh, your organizational discipline, your, uh, your adherence to the laws of the land or the values of the organization, everything will come how disciplined you are. So that self-discipline is uh, very, very important. And then, you know, as a leader, I can tell you, all leaders are sitting here, and I'm sure they will uh, agree to me, a leadership position is not always a bed of roses, right? 
it will come with its own challenges. And therefore, what will take you through those challenges is your humility, your patience, your perseverance, you know, your ability and appetite for risk. And at the same time, your ability to take a little bit of criticism also. You know, most of us get very perturbed when it comes to criticism. But criticism is inbuilt into the, it, it comes as, as your uh, uh, package, right? It is a professional hazard. The leaders will have to take criticism. So you are learning all these things through your trainings uh, in this beautiful organization that you're all part of, and therefore your humility, your patience, your perseverance, your ability to take risk, and also your ability to take criticism, these are the things that you are learning and you must identify it. You must identify these situations in which you are learning it today and you will have to translate this into the real life situation where you are going. That is something uh, very, very important in my opinion. And the last thing that I will add is, when you are in a camp and when you are working together, I think uh, it becomes a natural, instinctual habit to you of taking care of each other. You see, somebody gets hurt, you respond to it, you know. Somebody is sad, you respond to it, you know. Somebody has met with some experience not very good for her, you respond to it. So you're developing this sensitivity and empathy, and that should translate into empathy for the community at large. That is something very, very important. And, and of course, the last thing is, which all my uh, distinguished panelists have said, I'm only repeating it, in life, you know, you have to prove that you are brief, you are courageous, you are not dictated by anybody else, you are dictated by your own consciousness, and therefore, when a difficult situation comes, you don't have to dim your light, you have to brighten it further, and that will take you to the pinnacle of all the aspirations that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, because uh, I completely relate to what you said. Uh, I had a wonderful uh, tutor for myself, uh, uh, Subedar Timrayan, who trained me as an NCC cadet. So there's so much I learned from NCC, that's what I was briefing these young cadets as well. So the values is something that it's inseparable for all your life. I just wish you keep up those good values that's been taught to all of you in this year's with NCC. And uh, ma'am, uh, so I'll have a question with you and then we'll open it for the audience to have questions. Um, so we need to know one most challenging situation that you handled as a woman leader, that uh, which was really uh, pressurizing but still you handled it with grace and you were successful in that. There have been many challenging situations. Now I'll have to think which one should I mention. But uh, uh, I feel uh, just the start of my career was very challenging uh, thing, moment for me uh, because um, when I decided to contest election, my father uh, was in a different political party. And uh, I was truly inspired by Modi ji. I walked uh, up to my dad and I said, uh, Daddy, uh, I want to contest election, but not from your party. I want to contest from BJP because I think a pers one person who can really make a difference is Narendra Modi. And my father looked at me like this. That is our exactly opposite party. What are you talking? So I said, no, Daddy, but I feel that, you know, country needs a leader like him. So at that point of time, I had, um, uh, I had to face uh, that situation where I had to convince my dad that, Daddy, uh, I want to contest. And uh, so he said, if you want to contest, why don't you contest from our party? I said, no, I am inspired by Modi ji. And I was just 26. So uh, whether my judgment is right or wrong, I didn't know. I, I got that calling that... Uh, I want to work and uh, the reason I was inspired by him was because my district is just on the border of Gujarat and I had seen how uh, Modi ji when he was a chief minister he worked on, in those areas. Uh, so that time I had to face opposition from the local people who were working with my father 
and i was alone standing on one side and saying that no i think this is right so that time even for one moment i started thinking maybe i might be wrong because so many people are talking that no no hina don't do like this but then uh, somewhere i uh, had uh, confidence on my decision and i was firm on that decision because uh, for anybody to accept that one very young unmarried girl who is a student not yet you know completely into politics comes with a decision standing against uh, you know such a big mob and saying nahi nahi what i'm saying is right and uh, so i think that at that point of time i had to convince my dad i had to tell him daddy uh, why i'm saying this is because of these 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 things i had to convince the leaders in my district that what i'm saying is right and uh, it took me around 3 months for this whole entire exercise but uh, somehow i managed to do that and uh, okay and the most challenging part was i was fighting against a nine time mp who has never lost election continuously getting elected from uh, 1981 until 2014 and he was going to contest for the 10th time so fighting against a stalwart i had no other background that i was working in some youth wing or uh, doing some political activity nothing absolutely nothing but at that time so i feel that was the most challenging situation i trusted my instinct that what i'm thinking is in the right track and uh, yeah uh i could you manage you prove yourself and yeah <laughs> and then i proved myself not just by winning the election but then the next 5 years continuously i had to prove that i am better than the nine time mp and uh, what the people have shown trust in me is worth it so i think that was the most challenging thing for me and it, in I my life i'm yeah, sure it's beyond yeah. the words what you have expressed <laughs> <laughs> wonderful and one round of applause for our wonderful <laughs> panelists with us so let me now open up for questions uh, do we have any questions from the audience and please don't shy away i'm sure that uh, we are leaders in making so we should stand up and ask the clarifications which is required anybody has got any questions here yeah cadets Yes. Yes, we have leaders there. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, uh, all of you have, uh, you know, emphasized on the role of education in, uh, you know. Uh, for gender equality but i feel like uh, social media also plays a very big role in instilling the you know uh, like the importance of gender equality in the minds of young people and the exposure to social media is spreading day by day like more people are coming to social media but i also feel like as the younger generation comes uh, is getting exposed to social media before the school system gets to the minds of these people to teach them the importance of gender equality before that social media gets to them and the people who are opposing feminism or gender equality uh, those ideas get to them before that and you can see like i have witnessed even young boys and girls also opposing gen gender equality and cyberbullying has also become a very big problem against women and also men so how can we face that problem because i'm sure a lot of uh, girls and uh, also a lot of my classmates have faced this problem so how can we you know uh, may i know your name please malvika from alcon public school malvika yes ma from army public school alcon public school alcon public school so um, malvika and everybody sitting here i think in many ways she has articulated what many of you think um, because social media today uh, works at very different levels it works in a certain sense to equalize you at the same time it works as a tool and then it works as a weapon it depends on how you take it so i think the most important thing today is that for the first time in the history of mankind young men and women have been directly involved with protests 
they have been and on social media many great protests that have taken place have been done by youth whether it was the arab spring whether it was the yellow umbrella revolution in uh, in hong kong all these different types of revolutions that have taken place or candle vig vigils when a rape took place a lot of young people have come together to explore and also to sort of show people the atrocities that may be taking place at the same time there's a lot of distrust and some very unsavory and nasty comments on social media which means that as young women we cannot get so affected by what people say to us and our lives can't be defined by other people's likes i've noticed one thing whether it's snapchat or insta we're just waiting for that one ping to see if we put up our picture that's how many people have liked it who the hell cares i i don't i don't care whether 15 people have liked me or not and who are those people are they going to affect your lives are they going to change your lives are they going to take you somewhere first and foremost stop defining your happiness or your popularity by other people the moment we do that after all you're all grown up educated ncc cadets you must be having a value system that is instilled in you through your parents through your uh, schools through the ncc itself within that context i'm sure we all know what is right and what is wrong what is acceptable and what is not acceptable so why are we constantly allowing a person to shame our bodies on social media why are we allowing and saying a zero figure is what works why are we allowing a man being beating up a woman on social media and thousands of people liking it also so the point is i think social media should only be you firstly stop forwarding nonsense let's just otherwise the kind of forwards that are going around thankfully the government has stopped more than you know and they've said you can't forward more than so many things more uh, more than five times or something but in spite of that it's the constant forwarding it's the constant defining yourself through somebody else it's the constant believing half of it is lies i mean honestly a lot of social media is false news so i think you have to as a leader be able to sift the wheat from the chaff what should be accepted what should not be accepted and this is what your inner engineering is about kya sochna hai kya nahi sochna hai kya farak padta hai kya sochta hai ki aap mote ho patle ho chote ho kaale ho saavle ho aap ho so ho just cut it out let not a man or a woman define you that's all i say and social media is about definitions it's not about reflection it's there and it's telling you reflection is about thinking uske bare mein sochna kya karna and why is it that i've noticed one thing you go to a restaurant you know you order something are you start taking pictures and sending it are kha lo yaar paise diye hain but no first that picture has to be taken it has to be told to someone that you know look what i'm eating <laughs> are yaar eat it kha lo thanda ho jayega 400 rupaye diye hain uske liye same thing people are going for honeymoons are honeymoon ke liye ja rahe ho yaar us ladki ke sath raho ladke ke sath raho kuch baat karo pyar ki baat karo na it has to be shown on social media what a great time i am having i am having a fabulous time are yaar tumhara honeymoon hai mujhe kya <laughs> point is jo bhi tum kar rahe ho is it necessarily needed that the whole of course for hina ji she is in she is a statesman i won't call her a politician and so it's important for certain things to go out there good things to go out there but personal things what is the requirement maine aaj kya pehna main kaisi lag rahi hu ek muh yu ban raha hai ek yu ban raha hai and all those pouted lips and and pieces of your body are being revealed you know i have noticed this people are uh, young girls standing in front of the uh, mirrors and taking pictures of your neck your gala your breast your leg are kis liye bhai laate maine bahut dekhi hain gale dekhe hain just be yourself just remember you are who you are work on yourself irrespective of what anybody does so social media use it like a tool don't allow it to change you 
Don't allow it to define you. That's all I want to say. Ma'am, Hina, ma'am, in fact... Uh, I totally we... agree with you. Absolutely. Ma'am, Hina, ma'am, we wanted to know, because that's a very valid question, because now that we're doing programs across India for young students, this social media atrocity is one point which the students continuously keep talking to us. So on the legal perspective or on the political perspective, what should they do when they are being too taunted or when they are being too targeted? What is it they have to do? What will be your advice? They're also doing it to themselves. So what has happened is these days, uh, like uh, Dr. Amita ji said very rightly, she said, and I totally agree with her, uh, the profession I come from, every day, on every post that we have on our Facebook, there are going to be mixed comments. There are going to be people who are going to write so bad things. You actually feel like going and giving a tight slap to that person that how dare you like, write like this. But you know what? I feel you should not let the social media affect you personally. Achha likha, okay, achha likha. Bura likha, forget it, who cares? What she said is absolutely true. And um, we had, in fact, discussed uh, about this on different our women's uh, forum also of parliamentarians, that uh, especially girls and women, they are being so much harassed, bullied, like uh, uh, Mal Malika just mentioned. Uh, you know, in these different social media platforms, they have um, ways where you, you, know, you can report it if there is some derogatory comment on your uh, uh, photograph or some post, you can press a report on that. If it, uh, if, you know, it is uh, something that you feel uh, should be reported to the police, then we have an IT act under which there are certain things you cannot write or uh, there are certain things you cannot, say for example, somebody has uh, taken uh, a photograph from my personal account and sharing it, it is a crime. You cannot do that unless and until the consent is given by me. So, uh, you know, these rules are, these laws are already in place. Only thing is that most of our, uh, you know, uh, social media users are not aware of this. So I will uh, definitely suggest all our uh, girls sitting here that there are incidences where girls are being continuously harassed. There are, uh, uh, you know, dirty messages or uh, somebody sometimes creates a fake account in your name, yeah. sends... Uh, uh, weird messages to your friends and families and all these kinds of things are happening every day uh, What we need to do is if we see that something like this is happening to you You must report it immediately. That is the best thing that you can do because now uh, Government of India has made it mandatory for all these social media platforms to have their servers in India most of these Facebook and all, they, are, uh, they had their servers in the US. So when uh, any uh, uh, comment or any photograph uh, or any, say, uh, fake uh, Facebook account was created and you report it, so the police has to get the data. And when they used to write to these uh, platforms, social media platforms, there was not very good response from their end earlier. So government of India has made strict regulation that all these social media platforms who want to operate in India must have their servers in India. So immediately, within a given stipulated time, they have to uh, give the information uh, to the police where the... Uh, hmm? Yeah. Yes, and uh, uh, I think this will, you know, uh, reduce the number of atrocities that we are seeing on the social media. So, and I think, you know, what happens, many a times we see girls get afraid. They get scared, ki kaise bole, complain kaise kare. But I think there is, you know, if the harassment is too much, then we should not think about, acha kya hoga. Sometimes the family, I have seen this in many cases, that uh, the family says, Are, is se to hamari bachi ka naam kharaab hoga. How is tumhari bachi ka naam kaise kharaab hoga? If somebody is writing bad about your daughter, you must immediately report it and not think it the other way around. So that inhibition within the family for not reporting or uh, to, you know, kind of uh, dabao the case is not uh, what is going to serve. So I think uh, if there is any such incident happening, what the first thing we should do is we should report it. Uh, on the social media like Facebook, there is an option of report. You can immediately report it. I have faced this multiple times. Uh, somebody created my fake account, my, my photo on the DP, 
and uh, sent a uh, uh, friend request to all the people whom I knew, my colleagues, members of parliament, my constituents, and uh, started sending uh, weird messages. So the next day, somebody told me that, Hina, yesterday we got a mess, uh, friend request. We added uh, that, and then this morning we've got a very weird message. I immediately reported it on the Facebook, not a police station, okay? First I uh, did a report on the Facebook. Multiple reports that this is not, then they ask you, why are you reporting this? Then you have to give a reason that this is not me or it is uh, uh, something that is hurting me, like that, that there are some five, six things that pop up. And when you report it, Facebook itself removed that account. So, uh, you know, even if you don't feel that, okay, I don't want to go to a police station, but I want to report it myself, you can report it directly on the social media also. I think that's the best part that they have done. In fact, I had also suggested Facebook and Instagram. Instagram doesn't have that uh, option, but Facebook has it, uh, where, you know, if somebody, somebody can go to your account and download your photo, save that picture, I, had, I have written to Facebook that whenever, say, for example, my Facebook account, somebody is going to my Facebook account and trying to save the photograph, I should get a notification who has saved it or who has downloaded it. So tomorrow if somebody misuses it, I know that who has uh, done that. So uh, there are definitely improvements happening and Government of India has made it very strict for uh, their servers to come to India. So I think uh, now when we report, we get the information immediately. That's so, that's so warranting, actually. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. And yeah. from you, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that the, Malikpa, your question was that even on a subject like gender parity, you have got opposing views, right? So that's fine. I mean, that is why we have to work harder. And therefore, why don't you amplify your community of people who have, you know, agreement to your conviction? So I think we should not shake our own conviction in the light of opposing views. That is also very, very important, you know. So, so if somebody is saying that no, men and women should not be equal, you don't have to enter into any argument or fight or ugly spat with them. You give arguments in favor of what is your conviction. So I think that is also because social media, whether you be like it or not like it, it has become a platform for discussion, for deliberations, where people with all the views and communities will come. And it is very powerful, you know. It, it is a very, very potent source to convey your thoughts and feelings. So all these aberrations which are being talked about, of course, we have to take care of that. But you should not be daunted by the fact that some people are opposing you. That is just a suggestion I thought I should give it to you. That's wonderful and like uh, I can't believe we've been having conversation for almost one and a half hours but it, it has been really insightful for the cadets as well as for me and for most of us I'm like we've, we've really learned much from each one of us. So could we just quickly give a closing remarks uh, starting with uh, Hina ma'am please. Uh, so um, just to you know sum up the entire uh, discussion we had today one message i would like to give to all the young women sitting here you will always have uh, you know the good you do the better you do you will hear a lot of criticism like uh, dr ashok pandey ji just mentioned but uh, my uh, one message that i would like to give is that any criticism that you hear you should take it in a positive way take it in a good spirit Try to analyze whether the criticism is right or wrong. If it is right, you think, okay, I'm wrong somewhere. Try to improve that. And uh, in the opening remarks, Amita ji mentioned that you should not compare yourself with others, but you should try to make yourself the better version of yourselves. So I will always uh, say that criticism should be taken in a good spirit and try to get the best version of yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Amita, ma'am. It's been such a pleasure to share the platform with you, uh, Dr. Hina, and know such a young, vibrant human being, and I'm sure we will see so much more of you. And thank you, Ashok, for all your interventions and your wise statements. Thanks, Priya Darshini. I just want to, uh, because uh, I'm not a practicing Buddhist, but I, you know, I like a lot of the short little stories of the Buddha. And I just want to share with you a quick story which perhaps you can weave into your life, which is that one day, 
three monks were walking. And I don't know if you know what a chorten is. A chorten is in Ladakh. It's a whole heap of stones on that you have the flags moving, you know, the prayer flags you would have seen. So one of the monks said, as they were walking, he said to the senior monk that, oh, great one, I see that the flag is moving. So the second monk said, no, 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 the flag is not moving, the wind is moving. And then finally the third monk said, it's not the flag or the wind, it's the mind that's moving. So what is it that I want to leave you with? That for some of us, the flags move. For some of us, the winds move. But it's so important that for us, all three as women should move, which means that we should look at life in a layered level, in a multi-dimensional level. So whenever we find people, we should not be judgmental on them. Some may be the flags, some may be the winds, and of course, some may have the good fortune of having the mind moving. God bless you all, and may your mind always move. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amita, for this wonderful story. And uh, of course, this is the last statement that I have to make, so I must express my gratitude to the people I'm sitting with. Uh, but let me tell you, uh, in my life, you know, I have benefited immensely uh, with the presence of young girls and women and colleagues and friends. And the schools that I have had as a teacher and principal, you know, if the girls were not there, I don't think I would have been a good principal, right? It is the laurels that I received, uh, the contributions that they made in the life of the school, I think it was absolutely fantastic, right? And uh, whenever I think back that what is the greatest thing that has happened in the organizations that I worked, I think it was the presence of girls among the student community and the presence of lady teachers among the teachers. And therefore, I can tell you only one thing that you have to discover and you have to recognize your own potential and talent and your ability to make the difference in the life of others. And if you recognize that and if you leverage that and if you continue to remember that, I think you will make a contribution to your yourself and also to the community that you belong to. I think that is my message for you uh, just to remind you that what an enormous potential lies within each one of you. And it is that potential that you have to leverage, that potential that you have to unleash, and then you see uh, what a different person you are. That's what I can say you. Thank you very much. So let's close this session with a round of NCC clap, and three, two, one, we go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's been wonderful having you all over. We just have a small token of love for your time and for your insights being shared with us. So uh, may I request um, Ian Ashok, sir. He has been the former PTI editor for uh, the economics wing. And uh, he is also the advisor for Prime Point Foundation. And he's one of the biggest strength for the younger generations to taking up uh, roles. So to Hina, ma'am, sir. Sir, you come here. Thank you. Thank you. So I take pride that he is my namesake. <laughs> yeah, I'm a come and join. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, may I have uh, Mr. Varadarajan? who has been our advisor to Sansad Ritna Awards Committee. And please deliver our uh, token of love to Amita, ma'am. May I request uh, Partha Reddy, 
uh, who's one of the youngest in our team and he's been running around for about a week to ensure that the event happens with all grace. And just to give an uh, update, he is going to contest uh, in the coming elections as an independent candidate from Andhra Pradesh. Oh. So wishing all your wishes to him. Oh.